Um, so that's as far as inflammatory bowel disease. Our next topic is um, nausea and uh, vomiting. So I guess I just wanted to give you an overview of uh, nausea. So there is nausea comes from different places. Um, there is central nausea that comes from the you know the brain. There is vestibular na nausea that comes from the vestibular apparatus or the the vestibular apparatus. Um, is responsible for it. There is GI nausea, uh, nausea that comes from the gut, and you know all of these kind of combine to produce vomiting. So central nausea um, happens from the chemoreceptor trigger zone in the area postrema in the medulla. So there is little area in the posterior medulla called the chemoreceptor trigger zone, and any emetogenic substance, any substance that cause emesis or you know, or nausea or vomiting, uh, go and kind of irritate this uh, zone. Uh, also, it receives impulse from the vestibular system and the GI system. Um, this zone has certain receptors, dopamine receptors, so D2, uh, serotonin receptors, 5-HT3, and then NK1, which is um, norokinin 1 receptor. Um, how we can block the nausea from the central nausea is that we can give anti-dopamine drugs like metoclopramide. We can give uh, 5-HT3 antagonists like ondansetron, and we can give norokinin blockers. Uh, vestibular nausea comes from the vestibular apparatus, and these are th this nausea is caused by motion sickness and vertigo. So anything that uh, that uh, kind of rocks um the vestibular apparatus um causes vestibular nausea the receptors uh that are responsible uh for vestibular nausea are the histamine receptor so h1 and the muscarinic receptor which is the m1 receptor and how we can resolve vestibular nausea is that we can give antihistamine so anti h1 and anti muscarinics uh, next type of nausea is the GI nausea or gastrointestinal. Um, these can come from anywhere in the GI tract, specifically tongue, pharynx, and stomach. Um, and it's caused by mechanical and chemical uh, irritants that go into our GI tract and causes this nausea. Uh, the receptors in the GI nausea is uh, serotonin or 5-HT3, and it's pretty much caused by too much uh, serotonin. And how we can block GI, uh, how we can resolve GI nausea is that we can block the serotonin receptor by uh, ondansetron, uh, which is a serotonin antagonist. And lastly, vomiting. Uh, so what's responsible for vomiting is the nucleus solitaris in the medulla, and that integrates all the nausea inputs. Um, so that has histamine, uh, muscarinic, uh, norokinin. Um, serotonin and also dopamine uh, receptors that uh, lead to uh, that lead to integration in the nucleus solitaris and eventually lead to vomiting. So, with that in mind, we can go into discussing uh, antiemetics or the medication uh, that are uh, that. Uh, resolve nausea and vomiting. So the first medication that we're going to talk about that the most important is ondansetron. So ondansetron is a serotonin antagonist. So it hits this receptor 5-HT3. And the number itself is not important. What I want you to be aware of is that it's a serotonin antagonist. So it blocks serotonin in the chemoreceptor trigger zone and the vomiting center. Um, it's pretty much used for... Um, uh, for uh, it's used a lot for nausea in the hospital. So opioid induced nausea or medication induced nausea. Um, it's used for chemo, um, uh, chemotherapy or radiation nausea. It's also used for post op induced nausea and vomiting. Uh, side effects are the big one that I want you to be aware of, and it's actually tested a lot is QT prolongation, and um, specifically with other drugs that cause. QT prolongation. So that is one thing that I want you to be aware of. Uh, next antiemetic is uh, a norokinin receptor antagonist. It's called epipotent. So um, norokinin um, uh, receptor, um, or actually, let me backtrack. Um, so there is something called a substance P. 
uh, and substance P binds to this neurokinin receptor uh, in the vomiting center, the chemotrigger zone in the GI tract, and causes nausea. So we have found the, a receptor blocker um, that blocks the substance P from, from binding to neurokinin receptor, and hence uh, reducing the nausea and vomiting. It's used for chemotherapy-induced acute and delayed nausea and vomiting, and it's usually combined with uh, serotonin. It's not super high yield, but something to be aware of. Um, next is dopamine receptor antagonist. So example of these is metoclopramide, uh, prochlorperazine, and droperidol. The most important one, and the one that you'll see a lot in clinical practice and on exams, is metoclopramide. So metoclopramide blocks the dopamine receptor in the chemo or receptor trigger zone, um, and it's used for chemotherapy um, induced nausea or vomiting, radiation and post-op nausea and vomiting. Um, I believe Mike have already spoken to you about metoclopramide, but really quick, um, side effects from metoclopramide include sedation because it blocks CNS dopamine, uh, extra pyramidal side effects because it blocks dopamine um, similar to antipsychotics, and it also causes QT prolongation. Um, so these are things that are important to be aware of. Um, continuing with the antiemetics, um, uh, we can use anticholinergic uh, like scopolamine, and scopolamine is a muscarinic antagonist or cholinergic antagonist, and it specifically hits the M1 uh, receptor. It blocks the M1 receptor in the vestibular system, and it's used for motion sickness. I don't know if you guys have ever been on um, a cruise, or if you've heard of someone who's going on a cruise and gets um, seasickness, um, and they use this patch that they apply, um, and it pretty much blocks the um, the muscarinic receptor in the vestibular system, which leads to motion sickness. Um, so this patch is a transdermal patch. It's applied before travel, and it's changed every 72 hours. And side effects is anticholinergic side effects, um, dry mouth, blurry vision, things like that. Um, that's from scopolamine. Um, antihistamines um, are also on other medications that are used as antiemetics. So, for example, uh, diphenhydramine, which is Benadryl, or dimenhydrinate, which is dram Dramamine. Uh, these medications block the histamine 1 receptor in the vestibular system. They're also used for motion sickness. Uh, they cause sedation because, as we all uh, know, histamine is a neuroactivator in the hypothalamus. Um, sorry, in the thalamus. Um, and so blocking histamine causes sedation. Also causes anticholinergic side effects because unfortunately uh, these medications are not very specific to histamine. They also block the cholinergic receptors, so they cause anticholinergic side effects. Uh, next uh, class of medications is the antiemetics is uh, corticosteroids, uh, specifically dexamethasone. Uh, as far as I'm aware, dexamethasone is the only medication that is used for uh, nausea and vomiting. It's not really known how it decreases nausea and vomiting, but it possibly reduces serotonin release. Um, it's used in addition to serotonin blockers like indansetron for highly emetogenic chemotherapy. Um, side effects, we've already talked about it, but the one that I want to stress in this exam is the GI side effects, which is uh, peptic ulcer disease. Uh, next uh, class of antiemetics is cannabinoids. Uh, dronabinol is a synthetic form of marijuana. Um, it's not really known how uh, it works in nausea and vomiting, but it does work, and it's really used as a last ditch effort or last line of therapy. Um, for uh, patients. Side effects cause you uh, or, uh, euphoria and weight gain. Um, just FYI, benzodiazepines are also used for patients that are having um, nausea and vomiting specifically for chemotherapy. And they're used as an anxiolytic for anticipatory nausea. 
What do I mean by that? So some patients who undergo chemotherapy, they know that they will get nauseous. They get desensitized or they get sensitized to this to this nausea. So they have anticipatory nausea when they go to the doctor's office before they even get the chemotherapy, uh, they get uh, nausea. Um, so benzodiazepines are used as an anxiolytic. It kind of decreases their anxiety for that anticipatory nausea and also cause anterograde amnesia. They don't remember what's going to happen. Uh, so it's very helpful for patients that are undergoing chemotherapy for chemos that are um, highly emetogenic. So that uh, kind of concludes our discussion with um, nausea and vomiting. Uh, next slide is about pancreatic enzymes and bile acids. So um, what we're going to talk about is pancreatic enzyme supplements. The brand name for this is Creon. Um, and uh, how it works is that it just has um, the three uh, enzymes that you need, amylase, lipase, and protease. Amylase breaks down starch, lipase breaks down fat, and protease breaks down proteins. When do we use pancreatic enzymes? We use it for patients who have pancreatic insufficiency, secondary to cystic fibrosis, uh, or chronic pancreatitis. Um, so these patients, their pancreas is not functioning as well, so we give them pancreatic supplements. It improves the macronutrient and vitamin absorption, specifically uh, the lipid-soluble vitamins like A, D, E, and K. Um, and just a side note on the pancreatic enzymes is that they're enteric coated. And do you guys know why it's enteric coated? Actually, let me backtrack. What is enteric coated? Um, what what do I mean by that? So enteric coated that means that there is a coat uh, that covers the um, the the pill that prevents it or that protects it from being broken down by the stomach acids. And, you know, that is the whole idea. If I'm giving proteins, they're going to be, uh, if I'm giving these enzymes, and these enzymes are proteins, they're going to be broken down by the acid in the stomach, and they're not going to go work. So they're enteric coated. Um, and we usually advise patients to take it with meals and snacks, because that's when they're going to be uh, uh, effective the most. Uh, next uh, medication that we're going to talk about is a medication called Ursodiol, and it's a bile acid supplement. So where, when do we use uh, Ursodiol? Or actually, let me talk about um, what is Ursodiol exactly. So it's a hydrophilic bile acid, um, and it reduces the concentration of cholesterol in the gallbladder. Um, so as we know, when we talk about uh, gallstones, so... Um, there's two types of gallstones. There's cholesterol gallstones, and then there's bile acid, uh, bile salt gallstones. Um, so the most of the gallstones, they're cholesterol gallstones. So this medication reduces the concentration of cholesterol in the gallbladder. Um, so you're going to ask me, well, when do I use that? Um, so you use it for patients uh, that are poor candidates for cholecystectomy. Well, let me backtrack for a second. Um, so what happens when you get a gallstone? So a lot of, um, one fifth of the population has gallstones, but they're asymptomatic. They don't really cause any symptoms. It's only when they get stuck in the neck of the gallbladder, that's when they cause the inflammation um, and they cause infection, which we call cholecystitis. So cholecystitis is inflammation of the gallbladder. What is the treatment of cholecystitis? surgery to remove the gallbladder because it's inflamed. Um, however, there are some patients that are poor candidates for uh, surgery, whether it's patients with heart failure, whether it's patients with uh, poor liver function, whatever the case is, uh, or whether pregnant patients. Um, so we give these patients ursodiol to dissolve these uh, stones so that they don't have to go to surgery. Uh, right away. The problem with that is that there is high rates of stone recurrence, um, so the stones come back and eventually surgery would be needed for these patients. And that's ursodiol in a nutshell. Um, I'm, I don't think this is on your exam, but I did want to cover it because it's very, very high yield for, for uh, step one. 
um, which is the treatment for H. pylori associated ulcers. So H. pylori is a bug that causes ulcers. I'm sure you covered it a hundred times in micro, but I wanted to go over the treatment real quick. Um, so you can use triple therapy or quadruple therapy. Triple therapy it means that we're using three medications. Quadruple means that we're using four, hence the name. Um, the cornerstone for treatment of H. pylori ulcers is two things antibiotics and acid reducing medications. The acid reducing medication in a triple in both is a PPI, whether uh, meaning a proton pump inhibitor. And Mike has spoken to you about proton pump inhibitor. So we give a proton pump inhibitor usually twice a day and we give amoxicillin and clarithromycin. So we give both of these. Duration is usually seven to 14 days. If patient has a penicillin allergy, and you will see these on questions in the exam, that then you substitute amoxicillin for metronidazole. So let me repeat that. So if patient has H. pylori, you give them a PPI, so for example, pentoprazole, and you give them amo amoxicillin and clarithromycin. If the patient has penicillin allergy, then you give them a PPI, you give them metronidazole, and then you give them clarithromycin. Um, so uh, you can also do quadruple therapy, uh, which includes PPI plus bismuth subs su uh, subsalicylate, which kind of coats the stomach um, and uh, protect it from acid, uh, metronidazole and tetracycline, and duration is 14 days. Uh, the triple therapy is by far the more common uh, that is used. Uh, this is a disease summary uh, that we've made for you. We're not going to go over it, but uh, this is just for uh, your review. Um, also, <coughs> uh, this slide is not on your exam, but I wanted to put it here for step one because it is. I don't think we cover it really anywhere in a pharmacology class, so I just wanted to tie some loose ends. Um, I wanted to cover the treatment of hyperammonemia. So as we know, uh, patients who have uh, liver failure uh, have trouble secreting ammonia, uh, ammonia. And when we don't secrete ammonia, we get something called hepatic encephalopathy. Ammonia goes into the brain and causes encephalopathy. Now we treat. Now we need to treat this uh, hyperammonia. Then you're going to ask me, how are we going to treat it? There is two medications that we use to treat hyperammonemia. The first medication is rifaximin. Rifaximin is an antibiotic. It blocks RNA uh, polymerase. Uh, <coughs> it's used in hyperammonemia secondary to liver failure. And how it works is that there is bacteria in the gut that secretes ammonia, so it kills this bacteria, uh, thus decreasing the ammonia level. Um, the second medication is called lactulose. Lactulose is actually a sugar, but it's a non-absorbable sugar. Uh, it's also used for hyperammonemia secondary to liver failure. Um, how it works is that it acidifies the ammonia to make NH4+. So it gives uh, a proton to the ammonia making NH4+. Uh, when that happens, the NH4 plus can't get absorbed from the, from the lumen of the gut and that gets trapped for excretion, uh, thus decreasing the ammonia uh, that is getting absorbed. Um, lactulose is also caused, uh, is also used for constipation, and it acts as an osmotic uh, laxative. It pulls water into the gut, um, and it acts as an osmotic laxative. So that's um, treatment of hyperammonemia in a nutshell. Um, also, um, I wanted to talk about one more drug that I don't think we talk about as well. It's called octreotide. Um, octreotide is a somatostatin uh, analog. Um, so as you know, somatostatin is um, a, a hormone that is uh, secreted to stop the, uh, the gut uh, enzymes from, uh, from working. Um, it's used for acute variceal bleed. Uh, for acromegaly and vipoma and carcinoid tumors. Um, it, uh, um, I'm not going to talk too much about the side effects, but um, just know that octreotide is a somatostatin analog and it's used for a variceal bleed. 
Um, also, there's a section for hepatitis B and hepatitis C treatment and first aid. I didn't have time to go over it, but I think that's something that is worth well uh, looking for. Anyways, these are things that you don't have to worry about for this particular exam, but I wanted to cover it since we're talking about GI uh, pathology and GI uh, pharmacology. Um, with that, um, this brings an end to the section. I hope you guys have um, a good exam. Um, best wishes for you. If you have any questions, again, please don't hesitate to reach out uh, to me or to Mike. Thank you.